Hi, uh, my name is Case. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, more our attempts to mitigate integer overflow in C in Linux kernel. Um, I've got a link to the slides at the at the bottom here if you want to follow along or click on the links that I have in there. Uh, this is all part of the uh, Linux kernel self-protection project. Um, and so let's just dive in. So uh, the main question is why do we care about integer overflows at all? And honestly, it's the, the root cause of a lot of security vulnerabilities. You know, we have mitigations in place to sort of catch the, the effects of overflows and catch the effects of these things, like uh, control flow integrity is sort of a, an after the flaw has been, uh, been attacked kind of fix, whereas this is going after the root cause. Um, this is really difficult to get rid of in C uh, because of a lot of surprising behaviors uh, that exist. Other languages have uh, dealt with this head on. Uh, you can see like Rust has explicit wrapping types and things like that. Um, but the main takeaway is that at least in Linux kernel, everything we've been doing uh, doesn't really seem to be making, making much of a dent in integer overflows. Um, I grabbed a bunch of CVEs over the last 10 years and just sort of grepped for overflow in anything that was listed as like medium priority or higher. There's hundreds and hundreds of low priority stuff that's questionable for an analysis, but you know, we haven't really made any changes meaningfully in the kernel in, in the last decade for this, so it's time to start fixing it. Um, and a lot of this really depends on the, the nitty gritty details of memory layouts and other things, so I just wanna go over you know, what is an overflow, and the best I've been able to describe this is uh, having a calculations result exceeding the representation range for a given variable. In, in memory, like we've got an eight bit unsigned storage the bit just walks off the end and there's nowhere for the ninth bit to go. So we end up wrapping around. It's like uh, you know, modular arithmetic. Um, and for sign stuff with two's complement, um, as that bit walks further and further up, eventually it gets the last bit, which in two's complement means now it's the sign. So we wrap all the way back around to the negative values. Um, so this is the, the overflow condition uh, that in memory. Um, but for, for a language, for C, uh, what really is going on is we have overflow resolution strategies. What happens? What, what can a compiled language do about an overflow? Um, one option is nothing. Don't just do whatever the machine code does, which is sort of what that prior slide was. Um, and that's why we think of this commonly as overflow means wraparound, because that's the effect we see in standard memory. Um, and so the other is to explicitly wrap around, to say it is defined to wrap around no matter what uh, the, the, you know, the storage mechanism is. Another resolution strategy is to saturate. At overflow, you simply do not go beyond the maximum value or the, below the minimum value. Uh, we have an implementation of this in the kernel in uh, ref count t, for example, uh, which won't go, it'll basically saturate at an at a invalid value. Um, the other one, which we're going to talk a bit, quite a bit more about, is trapping. You, once you reach an overflow, you say, we were not expecting this, we can't handle it, kill this threat of execution, we cannot continue. Um, and then the favorite one, of course, is undefined behavior, uh, which is pretend we don't know what kind of CPU we're running on, uh, treat the result as undefined, and let compiler optimization passes do insane things. Um, so for... In the C standard for unsigned, uh, the C standard explicitly says, unsigned integer arithmetic overflow must wrap around. Uh, all our memory systems already do the right thing for free. This is easy. We depend on it. Uh, if there's some weird machine doing you know, one's complement or something, it would have to actually do the logic to explicitly wrap around an unsigned value. Um, but we'll come back to unsigned wrap around later. Um, most of our problems come with the C standards dealing with signed integer types. Um, and everyone just loves to type int in C. It's the shortest. Um, C standard says that overflow for signed types is undefined. Um, and this was in theory for trying to unify the C language across lots of different machines that weren't necessarily all twos complement or whatever, but this is absolute ancient history at this point. 
in practice for our systems, um, what this used to mean for undefined was effectively a none strategy. So we would get the wraparound because that's the type of system, the two's confluent system we were on. However, with modern optimizing compilers, um, we now have undefined behavior means let the optimizer hallucinate. Um, we can take a look at this right now. There's a relatively common C code pattern for checking for potential overflow by looking for wraparound. So if you say, if some value plus an offset is less than the value was, we've clearly wrapped around. Um, and this is like, oh no, okay, we should reject the wraparound. And if we don't, well, then we're gonna do things knowing the offset is safe. And then we maybe perform the calculation or do something else with offset knowing that we're fine. Uh, but after optimization, this effectively just gets thrown away. Oh, that's an impossible state or it's undefined and eh, just get rid of it completely. Um, this first hit the kernel in 2009 um, and uh, what we ended up doing was doing uh, dash f wrap v uh, as an option which says things are going to wrap around for sure. This is included in what we use now which is dash f no strict overflow which is a very strangely named option but basically this turns on, it forces a wrapping behavior for signed types. Um, to give an example of what this looks like. If you were to build with dash O2, this thing where we say, if value plus offset is less than value, then we can turn one string pointer, otherwise the first one. Um, if you look at this code that's actually generated, um, uh, it never looks at value, which is, would be in DI. Um, uh, it only looks at SI, so you just get a completely bizarre behavior that has nothing to do with what you actually wrote. Uh, not great. But if you build with dash f no strict overflow, then it actually does do the calculation and test against uh, DI, which is exactly what we want. And so getting rid of undefined behavior was uh, pretty important because more than a security issue, it just causes crazy things to happen. Um, so now, hooray, everything will overflow. Uh, not exactly what we wanted, but at least uh, arithmetic works in a reliable fashion. Um, the good news is that for catching arithmetic overflow, we do have sanitizers available in GCC and Clang. Um, there's the F sanitize signed integer overflow, which is the main one. And then Clang actually has a sanitize unsigned integer overflow uh, checker as well. There is also a pointer overflow, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. It's yet more of the same of these two. Um, the sanitizers, effectively have two modes. You can warn about the situation and continue execution, um, which is mostly as a debugging option, or you can actually trap. You can stop this sort of execution because we don't have any kind of, you know, handling of these situations in C naturally. So the only thing we can do is just freak out. Um, you can see an example of this. Um, if, we're, if we're using the signed integer overflow, uh, checking here, We've got you know, int foo set to int max, and we're gonna multiply it by how many arguments we've got. So uh, down below, if we just run foo, we get the result of you know, int max times one, which is fine. And if we add another argument, then the sanitizer catches it and says, hey, look, int max times two cannot be represented in the int type. You would lose bits off the end. But it continues and shows us the wrapped value, uh, minus two, okay. Um, if we're using trapping mode, we don't even get the report. It just dies straight out. Uh, it says, uh, this is very bad, bad, bad situation. So this is great. This means we could use the sign integer overflow sanitizer to catch overflows, except it doesn't work with dash F no strict overflow. So because it's not undefined behavior anymore, it's been defined to wrap around. But of course, the Hubisan unsigned integer overflow checker doesn't break and says, oh, an overflow did occur, even though it's defined behavior. So my head is spinning. The signed integer overflow sanitizer only runs when it finds undefined signed integer overflows, but dash f no strict overflow makes it defined, which disables all the checks. And the undefined behavior sanitizer named unsigned integer overflow uh, finds the overflows, 
but they're always defined for unsigned types using the wraparound strategy. So neither of these things are named correctly. Um, but the point, the main takeaway is, in the real world, we don't care about any of these details. We need to be able to instrument overflows, no matter what the resolution strategy chosen by the compiler is. We care about the result of that calculation. Did it do something we didn't expect? Um, so in, in that regard, I kind of want to rename the undefined behavior sanitizer to unexpected behavior sanitizer because I want to catch the places where we are doing something unexpected. Um, so again, uh, repeating, the sign integer overflow sanitizer needs to detect overflows regardless of the resolution strategy. Um, this has been fixed in Clang uh, now. Clang 19 uh, probably won't release till September. Um, but if you want to play with Tippetree on Clang, uh, the sanitizer, the, the uh, sign integer sanitizer will work here. Um, in support of that, uh, Linux 6.9, which is not yet out, um, does re-enable the sanitizer so we can start playing with it and finding where we're going to have problems. Uh, GCC still does not uh, handle dash F no strict overflow with its sanitizer. Um, and the unsigned integer overflow sanitizer hasn't even been implemented in GCC. Um, the, the main issue here, of course, is a social issue, not a technical issue. Um, and uh, I've been trying to convince uh, GC, GCC developers uh, that we, what we want is overflow sanitizers, not undefined behavior sanitizers. Like undefined behavior is nice for you know, debugging the C standard and how you follow it in your code, but in, in the practical world, and at least in how Linux operates, we don't want undefined behavior at all in any place in the kernel. It just asks for trouble, but we do want to find overflows. Um, so trying to get that, that shift of mentality um, and just make it work correctly the way we want it to. Okay, so remember about uh, open coded overflow detection? Remember this situation? Um, so now that we've fixed the sanitizer to work, uh, it'll actually trigger if offset exceeds value, um, which is what this test was trying to find, which is not great. Um, so we need to either... We need to identify these code patterns, and we've got two ways we can solve it. Either we can refactor the code and not do that, um, and this is probably best for signed types because they have this history of you know, undefined behavior, uh, even though we don't actually, actually have undefined behavior. Or we need to teach the compiler to recognize these, uh, the need for these kind of idiom exclusions. Um, and this is probably gonna be more important for the unsigned types because people have for 50 years been writing wraparound with unsigned types. Um, so refactoring the signed type stuff, uh, we can use the, the check overflow helpers, which are really just a light wrapper around the compiler's uh, built-in operation overflow uh, helpers that you know, will let you know if something overflowed. So the prior example basically says, you know, if I'm going to use the result of the of that calculation later, let's actually use check add overflow since it'll take, you know, in this example, value plus offset and stick it into result, uh, no matter what, you know, even if it wrapped around, and uh, and we can actually use result later. Otherwise, we can actually rewrite this to not do an overflow, but to actually just check the math on it, which is to say. If the offset is greater than the difference between the maximum value and the value itself, in other words, how much is left before you go past the maximum value, then it's an overflow. So we can actually do the test without triggering a wraparound uh, in the runtime. Um, and there's a bunch of these in the kernel. So I am lazy and I like to use uh, Coxnell or, or the semantic patching tool, spatch. So I have a rule here, you know, look for var plus offset less than var, we can replace it, or var plus offset less than zero, we can replace it. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're still gonna need to have to, we're gonna have to teach the compiler about this situation, um, especially for the unsigned types. Um, this is probably gonna wait because we have other things that we need to do and we wanna nail down having the signed integer overflow uh, stuff actually working reliably in a way that we can uh, move forward. Uh, but this is, on, this is on the list for us to do. Um, the, 
the main issue, the, the, probably the largest difficulty with dealing with wraparound in C is just answering the question, was this operation expected to wrap around? Because looking at open coded math in C, there, there is no way to tell. It is ambiguous. When you look at it, you go, I don't, I don't know what the developer wanted here. Um, some places this is easy to deal with. You know, if you're trying to allocate memory, you really don't want to wrap around. That one's straightforward. If you're doing, you know, hashes or other crypto and all kinds of other things where you're doing modulo style operations, then yeah, you're expecting it to wrap. You're expecting it to do those kinds of things. Um, and sprinkling the, the overflow, checking helpers all around the code in every single operation everywhere. You know, how about, you know, look at one function of a hashing routine. You're going to add, you know, check mall overflow in every single line where it's doing 20 operations to you know, cycle a value through, it's going to become unreadable. Um, we need a way to, to disambiguate these operations. And one of the ways that we've done this traditionally, both in C generally and in uh, Linux kernel, is adding a type. You know, GFPT used to be an unsigned int, so now we can actually do type checking on that. Time T is, of course, changing its width. Like, we've got things to do this. Um, so we need to create wrapping types. Um, so to reiterate again the, the approach, we can check for wraparound with the sanitizers, but to allow for wraparound, we actually need to disable the sanitizer. Uh, granularity is currently pretty poor. You can either turn it off for an entire directory in the kernel, or you can turn it off for an entire file, or you can turn it off for a function, or you can use the explicit wrapping helpers on a per operation basis, which is, which is really irritating. Uh, but if we actually have this type, um, we, can, we can apply it everywhere automatically and with one annotation. Um, so the solution that's being worked on is actually a type def attribute, uh, just named wraps. Uh, so in this example, we could have you know, type def unsigned int, with the wraps attribute, name it u32 wrap. And now when you have these operations, the compiler knows it's expected to wrap and it'll disable the sanitizer. And other developers looking at this code will say, was this meant to wrap? And they look at the types and go, yes, it says wrap. Look at that. Very easy. So there's a C implementation or a Clang implementation up, uh, up for review right now, from, uh, also from Justin Stitt. Um, and this works uh, quite nicely and makes, makes the annotations and refactoring way, way lighter uh, within the kernel. So here's it's question time, if you've been paying attention. With the sanitizer enabled, what happens at the end of this while loop? Let's see if anyone offers up an answer. <laughs> right, the sanitizer will say, "Oh, you've hit the end of you've hit the end of the, or as you're going through the while loop, you're decrementing num." And and it says, "Oh, num is 0. We're done with this loop. We'll exit the loop and decrement num." Oh, we've now decremented below zero, and the sanitizer goes blah. This is not intended at all. No one wants this. This is just bad. Um, so we can avoid this either by using, you know, in this example, U32 wrap, which is irritating, or we just refactor all these while minus minuses to a four, which separates the test from the decrement. There's only a thousand instances of this kernel. No one will murder me if I try to send that patch. Um, but the best if, it's really best if the compiler can be taught to avoid this. Like it should be able to see, oh, we're never using num again. I don't care about this. Uh, so this is an, another idiom we need to exclude from the sanitizer to make it actually usable. Um, and then, of course, for the unsigned sanitizer, we have unsigned negative constants <laughs> in the kernel everywhere. Uh, this has been a long-standing shorthand for saying set all the bits. It's like, you, I want all the bits set for this value, for this variable, or occasionally slightly less than the maximum value. So looking at all the cases where we have minus one unsigned long, uh, we could certainly replace with, with, you know, replace this with u long max. It gets weird, but that's sort of tolerable. But then when we have like minus two ul, it's like okay, we're slightly below u long max minus one. 
Uh, it's starting to get more and more ugly with these replacements. So probably we don't want to do refactoring against the kernel. Once again, teach the sanitizer, just ignore this. You've got an integer constant expression. We, we meant the value here. Like this isn't an accidental problem you need to warn me about. Just you know, actually give me the unsigned value for that. Um, and that replaces a whole bunch of other places where, or that fixes a whole bunch of other places in the kernel uh, where uh, the unsigned sanitizer trips. So now we're ready to catch flaws. So here's an example, very recently fixed, 32-bit wraparound um, in, uh, in an IO control. So we're dealing with a U32 um, that is coming in as an argument and being multiplied by basically anything other than a one, uh, which means this can wrap around, the allocator ends up allocating less than was expected. And this isn't a case where we would run off the end of memory before it became exploitable. We actually are doing a minimum, a minimum bounds on the loop that populates the resulting uh, allocation. Uh, so even though there is this you know, huge num of nodes, that came in, we can actually control that we're only going to affect a smaller portion of it. So as long as the NPDDS is larger than the allocation size that we tricked it into allocating, uh, that final PAI is going to wander off the end of heat memory and do things. Um, and of course, the sanitizer catches this. That's great. Um, though for note, uh, config ubsan bounds also checks the, uh, also catches this. Uh, it catches it at the point of trying to go past the end of the array. Unfortunately, that's just kind of good luck in this situation because both the allocation and the array access are happening in the same function, so the visibility is there. Um, so better do we actually catch it even earlier than ubsan bounds checking. Um, also go go read about the counted by attribute. That's a whole other topic. All right, so. We're ready to catch flaws. So here's another overflow, overflow uh, fixed last year. Um, we've got a U8 number of elements. Uh, we walk this list counting how many we have uh, so that we can allocate enough space for how many we have in the list. And then we walk that list again and set those values. Uh, but of course, as it turns out, the integer overflow sanitizer does not catch this. So what's actually happening? So we've got a U8 that's uh, 255, let's say. We're going to do num++. Plus plus. This is actually num equals num, and then at the end there, plus 1. But because the type size is smaller than int, uh, it's promoted to an int. So int num, and now I've got a much long, longer bit representation, plus 1. So this is 255 as an int, and we perform the arithmetic and the sanitizer says, cool, we've taken an int from 255 to 256. Everything is great. You pass the check. But of course, this is being assigned to a U8, so it gets cast back to U8, truncates the value, and that we die with effectively a wrapped around value truncation. <laughs> um, the good news is uh, the folks developing the sanitizers were not completely uh, ignoring this. and um, we have even more sanitizers we can turn on. So the implicit truncation sanitizer can now also be added to catch more of these cases. Um, the implicit signed integer truncation sanitizer is going to catch the vast majority of these problems because of that implicit integer promotion that goes on in C all the time behind the scenes. Um, there is the unsigned truncation as well. Um, now, of course, when you do this, then suddenly, you have a resurgence of the while whatever minus minus problem, but as it applies to types smaller than int. So again, we can refactor it by changing it either to a signed type where we don't care that we wrap negative or we do you know, U8 wrap. But really, as before, we just need to teach the compiler. We don't care. We wanted this. The, what, like, do what I mean, not what I said. Um, so the summary here is like all the steps I, I listed earlier, um, was we want to want to fix the integer overflow sanitizers to, to work with uh, you know to work with no strict overflow uh, to begin with. Um, we've got to refactor the open coded signed integer overflow test, teach a sanitizer about 
that style of open coded overflow detection, uh, create wrapping types so that we can start uh, fixing these cases everywhere within the kernel, uh, which is probably going to take a while because there's a lot of unsigned uh, variables in the kernel. Uh, but that's that's the plan. Uh, we have to we have to do it. Um, so we might as well get started. Uh, I think what's stopped people from doing this for a long time is that we had no way to mark variables. We couldn't do type. You know, we couldn't we couldn't show that kind of information about the type. So with the actual type def attribute, we can start making progress. Uh, teach a sanitizer about the post decremented loop variables. Teach it about unsigned negative constants. Uh, and then turn on the implicit truncation sanitizers and then continue refactoring. I'm gonna have some water. So uh, looking into the crystal ball for the coming year, um, Linux 6.9, probably coming out in May, uh, we've got now the config UBSAN signed wrap uh, for testing. Um, it's, it's off by default. Uh, because it does, it, it has known false positives. Um, we've been throwing syscaller at it and it spits out a bunch of stuff in like VFS layer and some other places where we have, uh, the kernel loves to mix int with things that it didn't really mean were int, but are probably smaller than U16, but we just used int because it was easy to type, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, so there's all these weird mixtures where we're passing an int down to things that are actually unsigned and doing strange stuff. So um, the sanitizer actually finds these and just cleaning them up actually makes the code significantly more readable. Uh, it, it disambiguates a lot, makes things uh, much clearer. Uh, but we still have to go through that and find them. Um, Linux 6.10, uh, we will have addressed all the syscaller false positives, sure. Um, and we can actually turn on... Um, uh, like make make the signed wrapping more widely available. So, you know, get the actual syscaller sysbot dashboard uh, that's that's always running. Sort of sick that config on syscaller the the public syscaller, um, and hopefully we will not drown people in reports by this point, uh, since we'll have found the low hanging fruit. Um, and then later on in September, we should see Clang 19 be released. Uh, we have the integer overflow sanitizers working with dash F no strict overflow already. That's, that's landed. We just don't have a released version of it. Um, wraps is up for merging. Uh, it hasn't landed yet, but we'll have that wraps attribute um, by Clang 19 almost for sure. And then we start working on the idiom exclusions, trying to teach the compiler about uh, not making us crazy. Uh, then for 6, Linux 6.11, probably in November, uh, we're going to turn on the unsigned wrapper, which is going to be much more exciting. I have a series of something like 100 patches where I was, I don't know, I, I spend my weekends doing this kind of stuff, I guess, which is I'm eating dinner, watching TV, doing whatever, and I've got the laptop next to me, and it's doing a build, and I boot it with the, the unsigned uh, integer overflow sanitizer. It boots up, it immediately crashes. I go look at what that thing is. I fix it, let it build again, go back to eating and just like cycled back and forth fixing stupid things and eventually going, okay, I'm gonna exclude the entire crypto directory. Okay, I'm gonna exclude all of networking right now because both v4 and v6 love doing crazy things again with confusing int and not int. And just, I end up with like about a 100 patch series that actually boots, I get to a shell, there's no warnings, everything's happy. Uh, looking at the result though, it kind of feels like I basically just turned off the sanitizer <laughs> everywhere. Um, so I think once we get to 6.11 and we've made some more progress with idiom exclusions, we'll actually end up with sort of a reasonable approach where we're not just turning off the unsigned uh, integer overflow sanitizer. So I'm hoping that by 6.11, we'll have uh, that for initial testing. And since that'll be uh, November, uh, following the Clang 19 release, uh, we can start actually using the wraps type attribute to start uh, fixing things. So, so another place I talked about hashes and sort of networking and VFS and some other things, but another one is actually timekeeping. Uh, there is a lot of weird math where you're trying to say, oh yeah, I 
that, that timer went off in the past. I guess it has expired. Let's move on. So it's actually expecting to wrap around. So one thing we could do is if we make jiffies mark it you know, as a wraps type, uh, all the rest of the stuff that's working against jiffies and other timers will uh, naturally wrap around without an instrumentation. Um, anyway, so progressing through that, we get unsigned wrap for wider testing. Um, and then we bring in the signed truncation sanitizer for initial testing and continue fixing false positives. Um, and then when that gets moved to wider testing for 6.12 6 sometime in April of next year, and we do the unsigned truncation, we just sort of continue progressing through these sanitizers um, and make this transition. Uh, so that's the whole plan and all the hiccups we've run into so far and the solutions we've got. So uh, that's, that's all I've got. If people want to ask questions, come on up. Hi, Kes. Um, the, the, I wanted to ask about the in, implicit conversion on assignment to a variable yeah. halfway through, and you addressed part of that. Yeah. Um, it's not clear to me, the, the, does the sanitizer also catch things like assigning an unsigned value into a signed value of the same size, but outside the positive range? Okay, like assigning a 129 to an 8-bit signed integer. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it does catch that, um, which Ugh. is good, um, which is uh, why, yeah, this, that's the, the first line here is like the implicit signed integer truncation thing actually does a lot more work as far as checking because it's doing that logic. It's saying, oh, whoops, did we, did we touch the sign bit? Um, so it, it ends up like turning that on there's just another boatload of warnings. Okay, so that means that would be the end of an um, unmarked char. Like, if you don't right. specify signed or unsigned, it's implementation defined, yes. and x86 defines it as signed, and ARM defines that as unsigned. Yes. So all char types should now have a signed or unsigned. Yes, and luckily, the, we, we sort of bit the bullet on that one and we define car as unsigned in the kernel now um, as of about a year ago and we had some fun with problems but we sorted it all out because we kept running into that but yes uh, for for car itself uh, we've thankfully uh, made it defined now because again oh, okay thank you yeah we just want to want to stamp out the undefined behavior in the kernel all it does is cause us pain uh, thanks for the presentation. Yeah. So I apologize for mentioning Java, but I do know that the JVM has a handler for when you get like a sick uh, floating point exception. So uh, how feasible do you think it will be to have some sort of mechanism in the exception handler for arithmetic exceptions in the kernel at runtime? Um, so C doesn't really have a great story for doing that kind of exception handling. Um, doing like doing all of this in C++ is actually pretty easy because you can overload operators and you can make a new type and just overload the operator and say, yeah, this is wrapping and that one isn't. And you can define your exception handlers. You can do all this. It's much, much more flexible. Uh, C doesn't have anything like that. Um, and in the kernel, we're not in a good position of like, so what do we do? Like, Right, I've overflowed. Like even if you know the, which instruction cost it at that point is undefined or it's just yeah. Uh, and so button. like that. That's why when 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 dealing this, we just have we just have either contain like yell about it and continue, or uh, or trap. Let's see where I got uh, somewhere here. Yeah, the, the the only things we can do in with the with the sanitizer is just warning continue with that overflow. Uh, which is nice for debugging, but doesn't help too much. So it, it gets us a situation in the kernel where uh, you can ship production code. So like distro kernels can turn this on, uh, which is what we have right now for UBSAN bounds for the array bounds checker. You emit a warning and then continue doing whatever disastrous garbage is gonna happen next. Uh, anyone who is super paranoid about the system state can set panic on warn or they can set a, a, a warn limit 
Like the kernel can warn this many times before it panics. Um, and that's to give us this flexibility between what do we do when we hit that situation? Because there's, you know, how do we resolve it? It's unclear because the, you know, the author of the code, maybe they wanted to wrap, maybe they didn't want to wrap. Well, eh, we can't really choose. So we actually have to choose to wrap around or choose to freak out permanently. Thank you. Hi, um, sure. just one uh, uh, last comment there for the sanitized trap mode. Um, we actually found that to be really useful for fuzzing, not generally uh, the Linux kernel, but more exotic embedded systems where the build systems are insane, like EDK2, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just way easier to add a compile flag than to actually link in a runtime. Um, only issue we found with that is that during fuzzing, once we find those issues, uh, it's hard to actually um, tell them apart which undefined behavior actually occurred. So if there are improvements being made to undefined sanitizer, it would okay. be great that the trap mode would actually uh, load some type of ID into a register before it actually traps, so that when the trap occurs, we can tell which undefined behavior occurred uh, yep. during fuzzing. So this is really a you know comment to anyone in the audience or anyone watching this video later um, who's working on the compilers. It would be awesome to have that. So. Yep. Um, so what's interesting is for the, the way the trap is implemented on x86 is the UD2 instruction, which is two bytes and you're done, you just die. You have no idea why or what. Um, on ARM64, because of the fixed instruction sizes, there's a ton of immediate bits available. And um, in, in Clang, not in GCC, in Clang, it actually encodes uh, what sanitizer and what sub sanitizer is causing the trap. Um, so right now in the kernel, if you do a, UBSAN, a config UBSAN trap on ARM64, you will actually get a meaningful splat. Like it'll say, oh, UBSAN array bounds and where it happened. Like it won't, you won't have any other context. You won't say, see what the variable is. You won't see any of that, but at least you'll have context about what was happening. Um, and there, there was actually someone as of last week trying to find the right solution for this on x86, which is to either, instead of using UD2, use UD1, which has a wider bit space, and do the same kind of encoding on x86 where we get that, uh, or do what we do for other trapping mechanisms, like right now for the kernel CFI, uh, every time a CFI trap location is emitted, it will record that address in a separate section so that at trap time in the kernel, it can go check that table and say, oh, hey, this address is actually in the, C the KCFI table. This was a KCFI trap. So we could do that also for the, uh, for the sanitizers and say, oh, which sanitizer is this? And check all the different tables. Fantastic. Yeah. Great to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. I love that you care about integer overflows. So just thank you. <laughs> Someone asked you. Cool. Well, thanks very much. Um, I'm around uh, at the conference if you have any other questions or you can email me or uh, anything else. So thanks.